When I was growing up, um, I was given a nickname. How many of you had nicknames growing up? Okay. Mine was a strange one. Now, my name is not Jeremiah. My name is Jeremy. Some people think I was named after the prophet Jeremiah. No. Um, but I actually had kind of two nicknames. You guys that grew up in, in the 60s, do you all remember Jeremiah was a bullfrog? Da -da, he was a good friend. Anyway, if I had a dollar for every time that was sung to me, I would be a very wealthy person. Uh, so anyway, that was one. Although no one called me bullfrog. That could have been kind of weird. But, but that song was sung to me all the time, usually by my dad. And then I had a couple of uncles that would sing it to me. But I had another nickname. And if any of you call me this after service, I will punch you in the throat, okay? <laughs> Let me just be very clear. There are three human beings alive that are allowed to call me this. My dad and my Uncle Eddie and my Uncle Don. But from the time I can remember when I walked into the room, and one of those three men or all three were in the room, it would be this. Peabody! I was Peabody. Now, if you've seen the recent movie with Mr. Peabody, I'm not sure if they were insinuating anything. I don't know. But uh, I was Peabody. And I actually enjoyed being called that by those three. But I, I'm no kidding. I'm not making this up. There were a couple of times that some of my friends would get wind of that. And I remember one day I was out at, uh, we were out on the playground. I was like fifth grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. And one of my friends called me that. And I said, don't call me that. And, and I said, you, you're not allowed to call me that. And they called me that again. And I swear, I hauled off and punched him in the face. And I got sent to the office. And, and the teacher and the principal, everybody in the school, went to our church and, um, and asked me why I did this. And, um, and I said, because they were calling me bad names. And anyway, it was my nickname. I love my nickname, but there were only a few people that could call me that. Because it was kind of unusual. Would you all agree? Yeah, Peabody. But I, I got called other names, too. And, and um, my parents would use other names, you know, like terms of endearment. And so, like, maybe you grew up being called champ or, or uh, princess or, or whatever. But nicknames are sweet. Nicknames are usually... Uh, whoever gives you the nickname, it's kind of like a special thing between you and, and that select few. Would you all agree with that? Say amen. Yeah. yeah. Now, <clears throat> some of you, you have a long name or you have a name like, you know, Charles, and, and so you were called Chuck growing up. And, and that's kind of, a, kind of a nickname. But I'm talking about like if you were called like Champ or, or Tiger or Princess or, you know, we call Miranda our love bug. And, and so there's something to that. I think we give people nicknames uh, really more than just a name. It's a label. It's a label. So here's what I want you to uh, kind of let burn in your mind for a minute. Names are labels. And we live up to our labels. Uh, so if you're a note taker, you may want to write that down. Names are labels. And we tend to live up to the labels placed on us. So if you grew up and you were called a sweet name and, um, and, and you know, or champ or whatever, and, and that's what you heard over and over, chances are you, you performed to that level. You, you wore that proudly. And unfortunately, some of you, you grew up in homes where maybe you were called bad names. Or maybe you were just told you would never be anything. Or maybe you were told you weren't smart or whatever. And you, you had other labels put on you whether it be from your parents or siblings or kids out on the playground. And, and so you begin to uh, wear that label. And over a period of time, you kind of accepted the fact that that label really was true and you lived up to that. Now, it's unfortunate that there are a lot of people who could uh, stand and, and share that testimony. Yeah, you know, I was told I'd never be anything. And therefore, for many years, I believed it and I didn't do much. And, and so, would you agree, yes or no, names are important? Yes. How many of you like to be called your name? Yes. Yeah, when somebody walks into, when you walk into a room, do you like people to go, hey, you? <laughs> no, you like to be called, hey, and then your name. 
One of the things that I've tried to do my entire ministry is to remember people's name, and I'm not always good at it. And sometimes it takes me two or three times, but I know people enjoy being called their name. And I learned a long time ago, uh, people enjoy their name. Like how many of you, when you go to like a souvenir shop and you see all the little souvenir tchotchke things that have names on it, you look for your name, right? And, and um, some of you have common names, and so your name is everywhere. And, and some of you don't have common names, and so when you finally find your name, you're like, oh, this is awesome. Because we love our name. We love to see our name in print. We love for people to call us by our name. And again, if you grew up with a nickname, you know, the people who gave you that nickname, you enjoyed hearing them call you that. Because names are labels, and we tend to live up to our labels. Well, the ancient prophet Isaiah, in speaking about the coming Messiah, gave the Messiah, Jesus, some names. And I want us to go real quick to Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 9, 6. It's going to be on the screen as well, but you may want to take some notes in your Bible and, and maybe reflect on this later. In Isaiah 9, 6, the prophet Isaiah thought it was important enough for you and me to understand the names, the labels that Jesus would wear. And, and don't miss this. He would absolutely live up to these labels. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says... For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I want us to take apart this verse for a few minutes and just look and see what Isaiah is trying to say to us. First of all, for... Unto us. When we see that word for in the Old Testament, it tells us to kind of go back and read. It's, it's kind of like a therefore. It tells us to go back and read what came before that. If you have a copy of God's Word, just go back and look in Isaiah 9 for a minute, starting with the first verse. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee. Of the Gentiles, that's interesting because that's where Jesus came from, by the way of the sea along the Jordan. Here it is, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Friend, Jesus came as the light of the world to people who were walking in darkness. There was a time in your life where you were walking in darkness. And if you are a Christ follower, you were walking in darkness. And Jesus came to you, and because he is the light, he called himself the light of the world. Because Jesus came to you as light, he illuminated all the darkness that was in your life. He exposed the sin that was in your life. And then you received him into your life, and he helps shine the way for you to walk. And so Jesus, as the light, the prophet, the prophet Isaiah talked about that. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Beautiful foreshadowing of what Jesus would say himself about himself. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. It's interesting in the 23rd Psalm, which is a Messianic Psalm. The 23rd Psalm is a psalm that points to Jesus Christ. And many of you know the 23rd Psalm. It starts off, the Lord is my yeah, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, I am the good shepherd. So the Lord is my shepherd in Psalm 23, pointing to Jesus Christ who said of himself, I am the good shepherd. And there's a line in there that says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear because you are with me. So it's really neat in the 23rd Psalm pointing to Jesus right here in Isaiah 9. Speaking of Jesus the light, he says of those living in the land and of the shadow of death. If you're a Christ follower, there was a time before you received Jesus into your life. Listen, you were walking in darkness. Agree or disagree? Uh, before you came to know Jesus, you were walking in darkness. And listen, you were living in the valley of the shadow of death. The Bible says that you and I were dead in our sin. 
That's why when Jesus had this conversation with a guy named Nicodemus, and Nicodemus said, what must I do to be born again? Jesus, or what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus didn't understand that. He said, I don't get that. Should I enter into my mother's womb again? Jesus said, no, you're, not, you're missing the point. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But that birth is not good enough because we were born in our sinful nature. Jesus said, flesh gives birth to flesh, but my spirit gives birth to your spirit. Why? Because, listen, all of us were dead in our sin before Christ rebirthed us. The old song, Amazing Grace, even says in there, I was dead, but now I'm alive. I was lost, and now I'm found. And Isaiah said, people were walking in darkness, and they've seen a great light, Jesus. And those living in the shadow of death needed that light, Jesus. If you skip on down, verse 4 says, For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. It's interesting because in Matthew, Jesus said this, Take my yoke, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, some of you may not know what a yoke is. When I was a little kid, every time I read that verse, I, all I could think of was scrambled eggs. <laughs> because I had it kind of misspelled in my head. It's not talking about yoke. It's talking about a yoke. Now, I know middle age and older, you know what that is, but some of you younger in the audience, you may not know what a yoke is, but a yoke is something that would be put around uh, an animal's neck and typically several, like two ox and, um, and, and two oxen, and I believe uh, that's the proper grammar. And so this yoke would go around the two oxen and they would plow fields. And so when Jesus said, uh, do not be unequally yoked, what he meant was, do not yoke yourself, do not come up against someone, uh, alongside of someone that you're unequal with. Do not be unequally yoked. Because if you had a, you know, a big ox and a small ox and you unequally yoked them together, you wouldn't plow a straight line, you would plow circles. So Jesus said, don't be unequally yoked. Don't yoke yourself with someone who's not of like mind with you. Someone who uh, is not... In the light. You want to know a lot of people that I've counseled through the years, a lot of people whose life has, has just been experienced, uh, whose life has, has experienced a lot of hurt, it's people who've yoked themselves with someone who didn't have faith, someone who wasn't a Christ follower. And they were, and so they were unequally yoked. Jesus said, Don't be unequally yoked. It just, it just makes for a really bad deal. You young people, listen, best thing. Best thing you can get from this is when you're thinking about that, that person for your life and, and even in the dating world, don't be unequally yoked because it will just make a lifetime of misery for you. Jesus said, I have a yoke. Be equal with me. Come, come with me. Take my yoke. Come alongside me. Hitch up with me. My yoke is easy. You yoke yourself with somebody who eventually is going to hurt you. That yoke will not be easy to bear. But yoke yourself with me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Isaiah talked about that. Isaiah said, you, you have shattered the yoke that burdens the people walking in darkness. And so these first few verses are pointing to Jesus. And all of a sudden in verse 6 we see, Therefore, unto us a child is born. I love that word child. For unto us, a child is born. It speaks to the human nature of Jesus. Yes, Jesus was born of a virgin. He was really born, just as the Bible said, of man uh, in a manger. It really happened. He was fully human. The God of the heavens left the glory of heavens and put on human flesh. And the word of God became flesh. And made his dwelling among us. And so for unto us, a child is born. But then he goes on to say, for unto us, a son is given. That word son speaks to the eternal nature of who Jesus is. For unto us, a child is born, human nature. And for unto us, a son is given, his eternal nature. The demons, when they confronted Jesus, when they encountered Jesus, I should say, in, in the graveyard, as Jesus was casting 
the demons out of this man named Legion. The demons recognized Jesus and called him son of the Most High. When Jesus hung his head and died and creation shook, the Roman centurion at the foot of the cross looked up at Jesus and said, surely this was the Son of God. It's interesting because throughout Scripture, demons recognize Jesus as the Son. This Roman centurion recognized Jesus as the Son. And yet you and I walk around in fellowship with people right here in our culture who still don't recognize Jesus as the Son. Jesus really is God. Jesus really was a human being. He was fully God and fully human. That, to me, is the Christmas miracle. And Isaiah was speaking to this. Now, you've got to imagine his audience, as they're reading this, it was blowing their minds because this is not what they were looking for in a Messiah. They were looking for a political leader. They were looking for someone who would come and, and rid them of the oppression that they were under. And so Isaiah said, no, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And he goes on and he says, and the government will be on his shoulders. But he's not talking about an earthly government. Jesus came and he preached a heavenly kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. And if you want just a little insight into that heavenly kingdom, just go to the Gospel of Matthew and start reading in chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, you're going to find what we call the Beatitudes. And in the Beatitudes, Jesus says things like, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. Jesus said that people who were hungry and thirsty and persecuted and poor in spirit, they were blessed. And the world looks at those same people and says, You're not blessed, you're cursed. But see, Jesus' kingdom is not the kingdom of the world. Jesus spoke of a heavenly kingdom. Even his own followers, as they were listening to him when he would teach and he would preach, they would say, Jesus, we don't get it. Explain it. And so many times when Jesus taught, he would say things like, the kingdom of heaven is like. And he would tell a story. Isaiah gave voice to that. Here's the beautiful thing about Jesus' kingdom. One day it will have victory over the kingdom of this world. And he will set up his kingdom forever and ever. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will restore peace and order in his creation forever. We can all read about that in the book of Revelation. And so he does a beautiful job setting up what I call these four labels. So remember now, a name is a label, and you tend to live up to the label that you've allowed to be put on you. I'm a husband, so I live up to that label. I'm a daddy, so I live up to that label. I'm a pastor, so I live up to that label. And you're the same way. You wear labels. And so labels are important. Names are important. And it's important for us to see what the Bible called Jesus because Jesus lived up to these labels. Are you all with me so far? Say amen. amen. All right, so let's look at the four Four words. Here we go. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called wonderful. Now, there's something interesting that happens in translation. In the original text, there are no punctuation marks like we think of in our language. Things were accented and so forth in, in, in different ways. So there were no punctuation marks. And so as people began to uh, translate Scripture... We have different versions. Some of you read King James, New King James, uh, NIV, New International Version, uh, the Holman Christian Standard Version. I mean, there's all these versions of the Bible out there. And, and in some of those translations, there is no comma between wonderful and counselor. But in some of those translations, there is. So how many of you are looking at a copy of God's Word right now where there is a comma between wonderful and counselor? Okay, I see a few hands. How many of you are reading a copy of God's Word that there is no comma? Okay, because a lot of the modern, more modern day translations take the comma out. Here's, uh, here's what I think. I think it can be both. He is wonderful and he is counselor and he is a wonderful counselor. But I think there's danger in, in removing the comma and for this reason. First of all, church, and don't miss this, Jesus is wonderful. 
Jesus is wonderful. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew word there for wonderful means to go beyond any capacity for us to wonder or even imagine. Jesus is so wonderful, you and I cannot fully comprehend it. The Bible gives voice to this because over in Philippians chapter 2, it says that even though Jesus was God, he, didn't, he understood that you and I would not be able to grasp that. We are not going to fully grasp the wonder of who Jesus really is. And so what did he do? He became human. He took the form of a servant and gave his life for us. That's what Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 talks about. He is wonderful. And I love this label. I love this name because this label qualifies every other label up here. He is wonderful. And for many of you, there are times where your life does not feel wonderful. For many of you, you've gone through things where it didn't feel like Jesus was wonderful. But friend, the Bible never says you and I are to make a judgment of God based on our feelings. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the way that you and I are transformed in our living is by renewing our mind. Renew your mind. Don't, be, uh, don't, don't live after the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I believe it's a healthy exercise every day to wake up and renew our mind in who God is and in, who the, uh, in what his Bible is and the truth of his word and, and that it's applicable for us living in today's day. And there are times I get up in the, in the morning and I, I forecast how the day's gonna go and I'll be honest, I'll say, man, today's gonna be a rough day. Today's gonna be a busy day. Today's gonna be a stressful day. Today may not be so wonderful, but here's what I know. Jesus is wonderful. And he will be called wonderful. And then there's a second word, a second title, counselor. He will be called wonderful, and he will be called counselor. The word in Hebrew there means one who commands or decrees. And the beautiful thing about that is Jesus is the final authority over all that there is. His, his decrees are non-negotiable, and they can't be changed, and they can't be canceled and so what God's word says is it. He's the final authority. Whether you accept his authority or reject it. Whether you accept the truth of God's word or reject it. Listen, what you believe about Jesus and about his word does not change the nature of Jesus and his word. You can look at truth in the face and call it a lie, but it's still truth. Amen? Just like you can look at a lie and call it truth and it's still a lie. See, what you believe about something does not change the nature and the essence of it. And so Jesus is wonderful. Jesus is counselor. And when you and I, those of you who are Christ followers, when you and I got saved, something amazing happened. God gave us his Holy Spirit. And it gave you and me wisdom and insight and discernment into things that we didn't have before. Why? Because I once was blind and now I can see. And as we walk with Christ, we begin to look at people differently. We begin to see people as Jesus sees people. We begin to see life as Jesus saw life. We begin to see difficulty as Jesus saw difficulty. We begin to see suffering as Jesus saw suffering. Because what happens, a beautiful thing happens, we fall more and more in line with him and his word the longer we walk with him. Because he is the counselor. He is the one who gives wisdom. He is the one who gives direction. He is the one who gives discernment. Jesus said this, if you listen, if you hear these words of mine and you put them into practice, it's like building a house on a rock. And when the storms come, the storms of life come, it will beat against your house, but you will stand. But if you hear these words of mine and you do not put them into practice, it's like building your house on sand. And when, not if, the storms of life come, it will beat against your house and and it will utterly destroy you. Why? Because Jesus is counselor. His word is final. His words are true. And he loved you and me enough to give us his word. Isn't that beautiful? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. 
and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful. Oh, how he lives up to that. He will be called counselor. Oh, how Jesus lives up to that. And then it gets really interesting because look at the next one. And he will be called mighty God. I don't know that that hits you and me the way it would have hit Isaiah's audience. But you need to understand that Israel was surrounded. Israel was surrounded by cultures that worshipped many gods. And even the pagan rulers respected, and had a respect, I should say, for God, for the God of the Bible. So much so that, that many times in referencing God, they would call him the most high God. Because there were other lower gods. And in, in, in Judaism, uh, they, they wore it very closely to their heart that there was but one God. As a matter of fact, in the Ten Commandments, God declares, I am. Worship no other gods but me. And now Isaiah speaks into this culture and says, the Messiah is God. And that was mind-boggling. Let me show you how mind-boggling it was. God's, God's word came true. Jesus was born. He made a declaration that he was God, and he was killed for it. That's how amazing of a statement Jesus is God was. It cost him his life. I've told you before, the four Gospels each have their, their angle, their, their perception. Matthew really uh, talks a lot about Jesus' heritage. If you read the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, first book in the New Testament, it starts off with Jesus' lineage, you know, all the begots. And, and Mark was the, the first Gospel penned, and you read that, and it emphasizes a lot of his miracles. Luke was a doctor. He was a physician. He emphasized more about Jesus' physical body, his birth, his death, his suffering, his agony. And then there's the Gospel of John. I love the Gospel of John because John, I've said this to you a couple of times, but there's some new faces here. I want you to hear this. If, if John were a, a, a thesis paper, the thesis statement to introduce the Gospel would be this. Three simple words. Jesus is God. There are a lot of people who have a respect for Jesus who don't believe he is God. There are a lot of people who recognize Jesus as being a good man and maybe even a prophet, but they don't recognize him as God. But listen, church, unless you understand Jesus is God, then you don't understand what he said about himself, and you're not taking him at his own word. Jesus is God. John begins this way. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the logos, the fullness, the authority of God. In the beginning was the Word, capital W. You can look it up, John 1.1. 1, 1, it's in there. It's reference to Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Here it is. And the Word was God. The Bible says that without Jesus, nothing you and I can see in creation would be here. He is responsible because by His very Word, He spoke everything into existence. The book of Ephesians in the New Testament clarifies that. And says that Jesus is the head of all creation. And that Jesus has the authority and one day will judge all creation. Why? Because Jesus is God. And he will be called wonderful because he is wonderful and he lives up to that label. And he will be called counselor because he is the wise one. He is the final authority on life. His word holds true. And he has lived up to that name. He has lived up to that title. And listen, he is mighty God. In the book of Colossians 2.9, it says this, For in Christ all the fullness, everybody say that word fullness. fullness. All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Jesus was not an afterthought. Jesus didn't come on the scene in, Christmas, in the manger. Oh, he existed before that. If you go all the way back to the book of Genesis and you read the account of creation, you're going to find where God said, let us make man in our image. 
Jesus is mighty God. And that's, to me, church, what makes Christmas so amazing. That almighty God wrapped himself in humanity, dwelled on this earth he created, with people he fashioned with his own hand and breathed his spirit into, allowed his life to be taken in the most cruel way, and then rose perfectly, conquering that which could not conquer him, death and evil. Why? Because he is mighty God. Now, if the word of God hasn't convinced you yet or anyone listening, then there's a fourth title which I think is fascinating. If we miss the fact that he was God, if we miss the fact that he was the fullness of deity in bodily form in the title mighty God, I don't think we can much miss it here. What do you guys think? Everlasting Father. Think about that. In speaking of the Messiah, we see a title typically that we use for God the Father. Everlasting Father. More specifically, the Father of Eternity. Again, this is another proclamation that the Messiah will be God in human form. John chapter 1 verse 2 says, And the Word, Jesus, was God. And oh, how he lives up to that title. Everlasting Father. Revelation says Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. The two bookend letters in the Greek alphabet. He is the beginning and he is the end. In other words, he has no beginning. He is the beginning. He, he has no end, for he is eternal. You and I, we had a definite starting place, but Jesus had no definite starting place. He was and is and always has been. Now, the writer of Hebrews qualifies this, and here's what he says, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Throughout God's word, we find where Jesus is spoken of as the eternal one. And Isaiah says he is the everlasting father. And he will be called wonderful. Oh, how he is wonderful and he lives up to that title. Amen? Amen. And he will be called counselor. And oh, how he has lived up to that. He will be called mighty God. Why? Because he is God. And if there's any doubt... Everlasting Father. And then this last label, the Prince of Peace. Depending on how much you've read the Bible, depending on how much you've studied Jesus' own words, there's some really neat things going on here in this title. You see, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. At Christmas... Some of the words that we use to associate with Christmas, one of those words is, is peace. Like if you get a Christmas card, it may have the word joy on it or, or um, peace. So when we think of Jesus and we think of, of Christmas time, we think of peace, right? So here Isaiah is saying he is the prince of peace. And it's interesting because Jesus came along and here's what he said. For I did not come to give peace, but I came to cause turmoil. I came to turn family against family and friend against friend. And you and I, we look at Jesus' words saying that and we're like, whoa, hang on. Because over in Isaiah, you're called the Prince of Peace, but now you're saying you didn't come to give peace. What in the world was Jesus talking about? Is this a contradiction in God's word? Is this a, a, a weak moment in Jesus' life where he just got up angry one day and just spewed off something? No. Here's really what Isaiah is saying. If you, look, if you look at the original language of Prince of Peace, here's what it means. Leader, commander, military general. See, you and I, we tend to think of, when we think of the word peace, we tend to think of no troubles, no conflict, never being challenged or upset. So like if you're having a, a really good day and no one's gotten in your face and, and, and you've just kind of chilled throughout the day, you've had a great day, you would say something like, man, this has been a really peaceful day. 
You take a, a, a beach chair and you go sit out on the beach and read a book for several hours and you would say, wow, this is so peaceful, right? But, but let, me, let me help you out a little bit because there's an old saying, certainly not scriptural, just kind of in our culture, ignorance is bliss, right? In other words, if you don't know about something, then you can be blissful about that particular situation. It's like when you learn details about somebody or something that you can maybe get a little bit more unsettled. And so we talk about ignorance is bliss. Well, you know, I've counseled people and families before who just kind of lived with dysfunction, whether it be in their own life or dysfunction in the home. And on the first meeting, they would say, yeah, I'm at peace. But they weren't really at peace. They just kind of accepted dysfunction over a period of time, and that became their normal pattern. Because really, we understand, y'all help me out with this. If I'm wrong, tell me. There is no such thing as normal. Amen? Normal is only established by a repeated pattern. That's it. When we talk about a normal day, we talk about a day that looked like yesterday. You go to your work tomorrow, and you have a normal day at work. It just means you repeated a pattern that you left off last Friday. So normal is only established by a repeated pattern. And there are people who their repeated pattern is dysfunction. And so to them, their dysfunction, their addiction, their negative mindset, their toxic relationships, it's normal. And you look at it and you go, that's abnormal. And they look at it and go, no, this is my normal. And somebody has to lovingly say, no, this is maybe your normal, but this is not peaceful living. This is not abundant living. What you're doing is destroying you. What you're doing is destroying other lives. And it may be a hard message to hear. Sometimes the truth is. And it may demand some action on your part. Usually it does. It may demand change on your part. Usually it does. But in the end, after you've heard the hard truth, after you've done the necessary things to make the hard changes, after you've gone through that time of unpleasantness, in the end, there is peace. Would you guys agree with that? So let me talk to those of you who have suffered from an addiction. That's one of my specialties in counseling is addictive therapy. I've never met anybody, not once, who sat in front of me and said, yeah, one day I decided, you know, I'm kind of bored. I think I'll become a heroin addict. You know, I was kind of, I didn't have really anything to do, so I just became an alcoholic. I've never had anyone say that. No, here's what I've heard over and over and over and over again. Man, my life was falling apart. I was in a bad marriage. I was in a, a, a bad relationship at work. I was, I was this, I was, I, whatever. I was in a bad place in life, and so I started self-medicating. I went out and thought just this once, and just this once was 20 years ago, and it turned into a full-blown addiction. And I'll ask that person, but do you have peace in your life? And they'll say, no. I'll have times where I don't remember what I did. That's not peace. It was just a temporary escape from my pain and my trouble. But I don't have peace. And if a person will stick in that addictive therapy and do the hard work, they will go through all kinds of mental and physical anguish and even spiritual. But in the end, they get clean. And in the end, they have true peace. Here's what I believe. When you have true peace with God, it will cause unrest and unpeace in your flesh. Because following Christ means you have to die to self. And if we, you don't take my word for it, take Jesus' word for it. He said it in Luke 9, 23. Jesus said this, if any man were to come after me, that word that phrase, come after me, really means to passionately pursue. If anyone were to passionately pursue me, he must first deny himself. That means say no to everything our flesh wants to say yes to. He must first not be selfish. He must deny himself. He must then take up his cross daily. That means you must understand there's a certain amount of suffering you're going to go, to, or go through, which is not fun which is not easy. Jesus said you must first deny yourself, take up your cross daily. That means there's going to be daily challenges that come against you and your faith. You must take up your cross daily. Jesus said, and then you're qualified 
to follow me. And when we talk about following Jesus, there is a leader and there is a follower. And if we're the follower, Jesus is the leader. Here, Isaiah says he's the Prince of Peace. What does that mean? It means he is the commander. He's the one in charge. And he's going to take you through some things that may not feel peaceful at the time. He's going to call some of you to follow him and your family's not going to understand and they're going to hate you and turn their back on you. He's going to call some of you to follow him and your friends are going to forsake you because now you're one of those weird Jesus people. He's going to call some of you to follow him and you're no longer the popular person in the workplace and everybody makes fun of you. You may even be denied a promotion. And there's not peace in that. It doesn't feel good. Matter of fact, it hurts. But in the end, following Christ, there is peace in our soul. The old hymn writer said it this way, it is well, it is well with my soul. When Isaiah called Jesus the Prince of Peace, he wasn't saying he's the one that's going to come make all your troubles go away. He's the one that's going to come and, and make all your suffering go away. No, here's what Isaiah said, the Messiah is going to come. And in all the fullness of God that he is, if you choose to follow him, your life will have peace that passes all understanding. Your life will have peace in the midst of hurt, even when you're going through suffering. Your life will have peace even when it's difficult and you're being challenged from every direction. Are you guys with me? Say amen. amen. That's why Jesus said, I didn't come to give you a temporary peace. I didn't come to play. I didn't come to be Mr. Popular. No, I came to radically change your life. And when I radically change your life, people around you, including family, may not like you anymore. But in the end, it is well with my soul. See, Isaiah 9 6 isn't about a cute little cuddly baby in the manger. It's about a mighty King Jesus who rules and who reigns and will bring victory over death and evil for all of eternity. Okay, maybe this mic's not on. Maybe y'all didn't hear that right. Let me say it again. Isaiah 9, 6 is not about a cute little cuddly baby in a manger. It's about a king, a mighty king, who has victory for all of eternity. Amen. Yeah. I don't know that we fully understand that or we'd be a whole lot more excited about it. Do you realize if you're a Christ follower, when you die, you gain heaven? Amen. Do you realize if you're a Christ follower, when you go through junk here on earth, he is with you and he will get you through and give you a peace that the world cannot give you? Amen. See, Jesus said it this way. In this world, you will have trouble, but take Heart, I've overcome the world. So let me give you three takeaways from this passage. I believe this simple verse has so much to say to you and me. I'm going to give you three takeaways. Hope you'll write these down and reflect on them later. Takeaway number one, there is power in a name. We sang about the name of Jesus a while ago. We sing about the power of the name of Jesus. There is power in a name. Those labels that you allow people to put on you, there's power in that. What does that say to me and you? Here's what it should say. You should be selective about the labels you allow to be put on you. Amen? When someone calls you worthless, don't wear that label. When someone calls you condemned, don't wear that label. When someone calls you stupid, don't wear that label. When someone calls you never amount to anything, don't wear that label. What label should you be wearing? Loved, accepted, forgiven, cleansed, whole. Because of what Jesus did for me. Listen, there is power in a name. Because a name is a label, and you will live up to that label. 
So you need to be selective about what labels you allow to be put on you. What label was put on Jesus? Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. And Prince of Peace. Second takeaway. Jesus is God. Don't ever doubt it. Don't doubt it, not because I said so. Don't doubt it because that's what the Bible says. Amen. Jesus is God. Listen, church, the miracle of Christmas, it doesn't end at the manger. The miracle of Christmas is like a, what I said a while ago, that, that Almighty God wrapped himself in humanness and experienced human life. Who knew heartache and pain and struggles and suffering, betrayal, and yet died for us anyway, willingly. To me, the miracle of Christmas is the Word of God became flesh, made His dwelling among us. And third takeaway, Jesus is for you. I said to you at the beginning of our worship today, you're not here by accident. Whether you planned on coming here or ended up here, you're not here by accident. Because here's the message I want all of us to be reminded of. Jesus is for you and for me. Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born. His audience was Israel. But the New Testament clarifies and says something very beautiful. That the gospel for Jesus is for Jew and Gentile. It's for all mankind. Jesus said to Nicodemus, for God so loved humanity that he gave his one and only son. What's the next phrase? That whoever. Whoever. Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, this is what Ephesians says, whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. And church, hear me well. I'm not talking about walking down the aisle of a church, filling out a membership card and saying, yeah, I want to be saved. Check the right box. That's not what I'm talking about. Salvation happens the moment you realize you're a, a sinner, that you're in need of forgiveness, and you open your life up to Jesus to invade your life. And he comes into your life, and he does forgive and cleanse. But salvation is not just a check mark on a card. Salvation is a process that you will live with the rest of your life. If he didn't change you, he didn't save you. Y'all with me? Say amen. amen. Salvation is about you encountering the God of the universe who came in human flesh, who died a horrible death, who rose perfectly and knocked on your heart's door and said, I love you. You don't have to wear the labels the world gave you. I love you. I don't condemn you. I forgive you. I accept you. And you saying, yes, Jesus, that's for me. And then there's a beautiful transformation that takes place. And it doesn't happen overnight. You have a lifetime to work that out. But 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, For anyone who is in Christ is a new creature. Behold, the old is gone, and the new has come. There's power in a name. Because a name is a label, and you will live up to the label you allow to be put on you. So be careful. Be selective. If I were you, I would, I would just not worry about labels the world gives you. Wear the labels that Jesus gives you. Amen? Amen? Number two, Jesus is God. Don't doubt it. Not because I said it, but because the Bible says it. The Word of God became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That's the miracle of Christmas. And finally, Jesus is for you. You know what that means? Because of who Jesus is, you have access to His wonder. You gain counsel and wisdom from the mighty counselor. You have security in his eternal nature. And then truly, you have peace in your life. For unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And he will be called wonderful. He will be called counselor. He will be called mighty God. He will be called Everlasting Father, and He will be called the Prince of Peace. And oh, how He has lived up.
to those labels. If you agree, say amen. 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 Would you pray with me?